Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you to Sudan for the invitation to come out and speak. It's a, it's a privilege, and uh, it's good to be back in Ireland. Um, so I, I got bored a couple of years ago. I, I get bored fairly regularly, and the latest spate of boredom resulted in me leaving my job at the time and thinking about what I really wanted to do for the next five or ten years. And I came up with neuropathology. And the reason is that um, it's moved along so much in the last 30 years that I simply couldn't resist becoming a neuropathologist. And I managed to find a job, which is even more surprising. And so here I am. And today I'm going to talk about two aspects of neuropath. One is the neurodegenerative diseases, of which the dementias, uh, such as Alzheimer's disease, are a major part. And the other are some of the, the tumours that we get. Two very different diseases, but um, tied together, I hope, by what I'm going to hopefully get across to you, is the central role of the pathologist as integrator of information. And concomitant with that is the key role of the, uh, the limbs and the information systems that the pathologist now needs more and more to integrate all that information. Because it's after lunch and everyone's a bit sleepy, um, I'm going to start with a horror story and hopefully try and keep you entertained. So this is a, <clears throat> a ghost story that comes out of Papua New Guinea. Some of you will be familiar with this. And uh, it's really based around this tribal cluster called the Foray uh, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, who really got upset about their dead because if they found out if they buried them in the ground, they got eaten by worms. If they left them out, they got eaten by the maggots of the flies that settled upon them. And this is, this is Papua New Guinea, it's tropical. There are a lot of flies and they're big ones. They didn't like this, so they decided to adopt a third option, which was to eat the dead. And that sort of worked okay. Here's a picture of a mortuary feast where they prepare the body and then they eat most of the entrails. Um, muscle, etc., including the gallbladder. And apparently, according to this person who indulged in this uh, practice before it was outlawed, um, it tastes really good. So this is all fine. Um, the problem was that, unbeknownst to them, around possibly the 1890s, one of the people who died had undergone a spontaneous mutation in a gene called PRMP. And this mutation gave rise to an abnormal protein, which accumulated in his brain. Now, these mortuary feasts, as I say, they ate just about everything, including the brains. And it was mostly the women and the young kids who ate these brains. Um, this was all unbeknownst to them, this mutation, of course. And it spread through the tribe as they ate the brain, the abnormal brain, which contained these abnormal particles. Um, spread to another member of the tribe who then died and they kept eating and basically this tribe cloned this abnormal particle. So you got cloning at a tribal level. When I started molecular biology we used to use E. coli to clone, this is cloning at the tribal level. And unfortunately they got this really nasty disease um, which was called Kuru which means to tremble from fear or cold in the language of the foray. <clears throat> so it goes through three phases, and the duration varies among the people. There's an ambulant phase where people can still walk, but they, they limp, they walk with difficulty, increasing difficulty. Then they're unable to walk, it's called the sedentary phase. They also get emotional aberrations, and then finally there's a terminal phase where they basically lose control of all their body functions. So basically it's a neurodegenerative disease which affects all parts of the brain, and you end up unable to move, unable to control your bowel motions, and eventually you suffocate because you can't breathe. Um, often you die before infection before that. Uh, Carlton Gadgetek and Vince Zegas um, worked on these people, and this, this was in the 1950s. Um, when he published this paper, a 
another researcher who had worked on veterinary pathology said, hey, the brains you've described, which are full of holes, as you can see, um, look like those of the sheep's brain in a disease called scrapie. And they, on further investigation, found various um, protein accumulations in these brains. And Gadutek hypothesized that this is a transmissible dementia, and indeed he showed it, um, that he could transmit it um, to higher primates. For that he got the Nobel Prize. That's in there, and that's in there with the Kuru patient. Um, but they really didn't understand. They knew it was something transmissible, they didn't understand what it was. Um, moving on a couple of decades, a similar phenomenon occurred and arose in Great Britain, known as mad cow disease, and I'm sure that this was an effort of the traditional emery enemies of the, the English mostly, but um, this, this effort, so it's probably the French who came up with this <laughs> stamp, and I'm just working through that now, contacting philatelists worldwide to try and sort of work out how this happened. Um, it's in poor taste, but I thought I should show it anyway. Um, and so this, this disease occurred, and as you know, um, a few, about 200 or so unfortunate um, humans also got this disease before they got on top of the epidemic. Three cases occurred in the USA, um, at least three, possibly more, and here's a cartoonist from St. Louis, um, his take on the USDA's uh, approach to mad cow disease, which is basically seemed to be sort of in summary, not much. Um, and indeed, it, it wasn't a big headliner in the US, US and there's a number of um, theories behind that which I can engage people with discussion afterwards if they, if they wish. Um, but anyway, so that, there's a, you know, this is a, a phenomenon that it's a similar disease type in humans. Other dementias back then, as I said, this is from the period of the 50s to the 70s. We knew about Alzheimer's. We knew in Alzheimer's, if you looked microscopically, you got these, a number of aberrations. One, for example, these tangles, these big purple strands of um, accumulated protein in the neurons that obviously negatively affect the function of the neurons. So you get neuronal death and shrinkage of the brain. This is an Alzheimer type brain, and this is a, a control here. Um, there, there's other dementias called frontotemporal. You can see, if you contrast this part of the brain to that part, this is what the normal gyri look like. They're quite fat with a smooth border. Here, there's these ravines. That's due to atrophy of, of um, millions of neurons in the gyri, uh, leaving mostly nothing. So you, this entire part, of the functional activities emanating from this part of the brain basically don't exist anymore. And Parkinson's and the related dementia, Lewy body dementia, we knew about as well. But we were kind of ignorant. So this is taken from a book called Brains Clinical Neurology, 1977. So Kuru, which I started talking about earlier, and Kreutzfeldt Jakob were thought to be due to slow viruses. Viruses that took a long time to manifest their effect. They were the pre dementias, Alzheimer's, multisystem atrophy, <coughs> Um, there was Parkinson's, and we only knew some basic pathology. So there were happy days. Um, and had I taken up neuropath then, I would have, I guess, had the sort of day that most of my colleagues had then, which is you work for about one hour, and then you go sailing on Sydney Harbour, or something similar. Um, which is what they used to do, I'm told, at the University of Sydney, by reliable sources. That's, that's how the neuropath um, world was then. Um, so low tech, ignorance about true cause and pathogenesis um, and uh, evolution of disease. And of course the limbs, well, there weren't really such things as limbses. So happy days for everybody. Um, and I'll just take a little sideways uh, sort of step here. More recently, we've discovered some of the genetic predisposing factors for some of the diseases. And the diseases in the group of Kuru and Kreutzfeldt-Jakob, um, Scrapie, etc., in humans, there 
is a predisposing variant at codon 129 of this um, gene. This is PRNP, a prion protein gene. And this variant is quite is interesting. Uh, certain, certain variants predispose you to developing this disease. So um, about 99% of the young people who got uh, the mad cow disease uh, it's called VCJD, variant creutzfeldt jakob disease. About 99% had a variant of a certain type. Um, and they, they all got rapid progression um, from about 5 months to 18 months and they all died. And then uh, the other variants seem to be in part a resistance to developing this disease. And this is the case as well in Kuru. And so in Papua New Guinea, if you look at the genotypes of those that survived, the predisposing variants are virtually non-existent. So anyone who got the infected meat from the body, ate it and had a predisposing variant, got Kuru and died. Okay, so they didn't reproduce any further. So gradually what you got, you got rid of the predisposing variants from the population and you're left with other variants. And it turns out that some of these other variants are actually give you a resistance to developing Kuru. So you had there a selection, a natural selection occurring in one tribe um, based on one disease developing that the predisposing variants were bred out of, this, of the, the, the community and they were left with relatively resistant variants. So it's kind of much more complicated than, than we thought, but um, we found that's also true now for, as I said, the variant CJD that people got from eating the infected meat in, in the UK in the 80s. So bear this in mind, at the risk variants and the also resistance variants. And when they looked further, they found that these resistant variants were also present in other population groups in the world. So they deduced from this that there was probably cannibalism in these populations. And there are reports of cannibalism. This is from a rather interesting book called The Florentine Codex, which was um, from knowledge accumulated by a Catholic priest about four or five hundred years ago when the Spanish first got to South America. Um, he accumulated knowledge of local customs, practices, languages, etc. And here it clearly shows behavior similar to the 4A tribe in Papua New Guinea, um, the eating of human parts. So there's evidence of, uh, of, of cannibalism in other populations throughout history. And so, as I said, there's the, the, the risk alleles, the ones that predispose you to developing, but also there's the alleles that um, acquire, that, that provide you with the resistance to developing the disease. So from this paper, um, there was the following, which is kind of an interesting conclusion. Be smarter, eat brains, implying that you are more likely to develop in the population a resistance allele if you do undergo a phase of cannibalism and get rid of all those who are susceptible. So this is kind of popularizing, you know, this is the current um, type of show on TV. This is, you could imagine this occurring there where they get a group of people together in a house and they have relationships and things. It's sort of appropriate for that level of, of thought. Okay, so that's one way to interpret that information. And so, it, you know, we just need to ask this question, have we seen the last of cannibalism in our society? I mean, it's obviously been widespread in the past. Why should it die out? Are there still people out there doing this sort of thing? Well, look at that. Placenta indulgence. Now, I hope no one in this room has done this, but it's quite, you know, common. Singaporean mums eating their own placenta. This is all over the press. You can find it on a Google search. Human cannibalism, those are the search terms I used. World's first placenta on a chip, I'm not sure if that's fries with the placenta <laughs> or whether it's some synthetic biotech apparatus from a new startup or something like that. But um, it's, obviously, it's obviously still out there. And um, moving further, this is in remote Western Australia. Don't go there <laughs> and, until this has all been sorted out. Okay, that's my recommendation. So, that was then, 
um, a sort of happier, quieter time for neuropathologists. Now it's just got a lot more challenging. So now we know this, this is after another 30 years or so, that these neurodegenerative diseases, most of them are characterized by abnormal deposits of proteins. Here's the protein here in the cell. That big blob should not be there. These blobs should not be there. Some of them are intracellular and some are extracellular. Um, we know that almost all of them, regardless of the type, result in these, these blobs are formed from the abnormal accumulation of slightly altered proteins. So it forms this nexus on which more abnormal proteins pack and eventually form this mass of protein which affects the function of the cells, the neurons or the glia and sometimes both. The glia or the cells that assist the neurons in sort of maintaining their integrity. So you get this packing of uh, abnormal protein in a large mass that the cell just cannot deal with and that gives rise to neurodegeneration. And of course, none of this is new because even before the 70s, Kurt Vonnegut worked all this out from Cat's Cradle. I don't know if you've ever read this book. If you haven't, you should. There's several ways, Dr. Breed said, in which certain liquids can crystallize. Two different crystals of the same substance can have quite different physical properties. The theoretical villain is called a seed. The seed taught the atoms a novel way in which to stack and lock, to crystallize, to freeze. Think about cannonballs on a courthouse lawn or about oranges in a crate. That is exactly what this is about. So Kurt Vonnegut worked it out as a science fiction author. And to my knowledge, he was never a neuropathologist. However, he was totally right. So now, we know that there are abnormal proteins packing. How do these abnormal proteins um, affect the brain in, in a big way and basically give you terminal dementia? Well, here are fMRI scans. So these are functional scans of people's brains, um, thinking certain thoughts, getting certain stimuli like music, light, etc. And you can see that these patterns ramify extensively throughout the brain. And armed with that knowledge and other studies, we now know that abnormal proteins in dementias, and there's amyloid beta and tau in Alzheimer's, travel. They start off in one part of the brain and they travel via the nerve tracts to other parts and cause dysfunction there. From there, they might travel even further. So you get this disease process starting in one part and spreading right throughout the brain and causing abnormalities that are widespread. And here you can see, for example, different diseases. Just look at the different colors. Alzheimer's is in, in orange, causing abnormalities in different parts of the brain. So each of these disease types has a slightly different impact on the functionality of the brain and sometimes a, a significantly different impact. So abnormal proteins spreading through the brain through the different neuroconnective pathways and there's nothing you can do about this at the moment. Neurons connect to each other, that's how the brain works. It's one huge synthetic whole functionally and unfortunately these abnormal proteins use these tracts to spread. And so you end up with this sort of schema Different types of proteins, this is the prion protein in Kreutzfeldt Jakob Kuru, this group here. Here's a taxon in ALS, for example. Um, here is uh, Huntington in Huntington's disease, alpha synuclein in Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. Different proteins, but all behaving in a similar way, abnormal aggregates and spreading throughout the body in an inexorably progressive disease. So the key concepts, Accumulation of abnormally folded proteins, they cause abnormal cellular function, they spread to the connective nerve pathways, this is now called the connectome, and many patients don't have only one type. So trying to diagnose somebody's dementia is often complicated by the fact they might have three different types of abnormality going on at once. Generally, at the moment, it's irreversible, but the question is, can you modulate it? Can you detect it early enough so you can somehow modulate the packing of this protein and possibly even enhance the clearance of these abnormals? Who knows, but that's our current pathway to treat, one of the current pathways to treatment. So, as I said, this is the now, just taking one disease, and this is a highly simplified slide. This is what we now know. Um, we have various biomarkers, 
we can uh, use advanced imaging to identify exactly which part of the brain is affected. Uh, we can use molecular imaging, um, including metabolic studies using um, glucose metabolism labeling. We can image the tau protein, we can image the, uh, the APP protein, um, we can test for genetic predisposition, um, and we can look at CSF biomarkers. So this is where it's got to, 30 years later, a whole lot more information. And putting it all together, various, uh, these are the disease sort of category types down here, um, the, the syndromes, various diseases predisposing to each one, um, normal proteins encoded by these, but when they mutated, you get abnormal proteins packing and causing these various syndromes. So that's the current scheme, which is very different from what we knew in the 1970s and has made the job of a neuropathologist, unfortunately, a full day at right now. Um, just to show you some of the imaging, so this is uh, looking at um, tower protein in various dimensions. So this is, a, as I said, an abnormal protein that packs and forms those tangles that I showed you in one of the earlier slides. Um, and it can be extremely widespread and, as I said, right now is, is irreversible. Interestingly, in recent years, um, there has been an interesting connection made between the, the gut microbiome, which people are now increasingly beginning to analyse, and the development of things like Parkinson's disease. Because uh, abnormal, probable chemicals, they think, are spreading up through the vagus nerve into the brain and affecting the packing of the protein. Um, additional features are now, we're now looking at the population level for uh, data of similarities of people with dementias, um, without dementia, etc., and trying to look at overall possible lifestyle and other predisposing factors. And we can get this down to um, biomarker changes in a single process over time. So that's all fine. Um, now, to function in the mod as a modern-day neuropathologist, you need a limbs that can do a whole lot of things so that you can be the integrator. Just going to flick through this quickly. You need to be able to address and access the functional images, um, the MRIs, which show you which parts are atrophied, histo, uh, including immuno, uh, the genetics, uh, the, the uh, CSF analyses, population level uh, information, and possibly in certain dimensions, even the microbiome. So that all has to be accessible in the limbs for a functioning neuropathologist in order to be able to deal with cases um, that we now uh, diagnose and have to work up and manage. So as you, I hope you'll agree, it's changed enormously in, in the 30 years, which actually isn't a long time and the extent of change is, is exponential. An example of an emerging disease, for example, here is um, CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and this disease is one that uh, people with repeated head trauma in sport are prone to. Uh, this is a normal brain slice here, and this is a uh, NFL player um, whose name I can't remember, but you can see that brown is abnormal. This is tau protein that is deposited. So this is after, uh, you know, an, lots of hits. And the estimates are, some players have, uh, one person estimated 44,000 hits in a professional career from the time they start playing at school to the time they retire. And this is a non-trivial non disease. These are not people in their 70s and 80s dying of dementia. These are people in their 30s becoming highly aggressive, losing their memory, and then committing suicide. That's the sort of pattern, 30s and into the 40s. And of 100, I think it was 103 NFL players who donated their brains, 102 had CTE. Other sports like ice hockey, um, uh, etc. Are, are following suit in terms of this discovery and of course there's a usual pushback from the professional organizations the same playbook as cigarettes and you know sugar and blah blah, blah that it's not us it's got no link etc etc so this is unfolding as we speak 
And all this novel knowledge and the ability to scan biomarkers in situ will help us monitor these people as these diseases progress and hopefully intervene. So brain tumours, just going to run through a couple of novel concepts and then put it into the context of the modern day limbs. Um, in the old days, you said somebody had you know, a, a high grade glioma. Glioma is a type of, a type of common brain tumour and you left it at that. Now we say diffuse midline glioma, H3K27 mutant. Glioblastoma, which is the most aggressive type of adult brain tumour, the primary brain tumour, we now say glioblastoma, IDH wild type, and then give a, a grade according to the WHO um, uh, prescription. So th this has all changed. We never used to have this until the last few years, this sort of um, molecular annotation to the diagnosis. So what is actually going on here? Well, we've got to talk a bit about flies. So I hope everyone's finished their, their food. Um, and in particular, this type of fly, polycomutant. So these little bristles here are used for mating in flies. And this polycomutant is named because it has too many bristles. And also, it has legs growing out where it should have antennae. Okay, so this, what this is, is an indicator, it also has a hairy chest, you shouldn't have this much hair on, on its chest, and it has a lot. Um, it's an indicator of a significant aberration in the developmental pathway. So when you start getting legs growing out where you should have antennae, this, that's been a major switch um, in the, the, the pupil, state, pupil stage in metamorphosis of saying don't grow an antenna, grow a leg. Something significant has transformed and gone, sent the cell, developing cells down into a completely different direction. And so in a context, essentially this is the tree of life. We're up here, this is animals. So basically, you know, in terms of this, we flies. Okay, we, we're just bigger, we've got more cells, we've got more neuronal connections, possibly more emotions, etc. But we do all the things that flies do. We eat, we, we sort of locomote, we mate, uh, we excrete things, etc. So we flies. So by looking at flies, you can learn an awful lot about human biology. And just as an aside, um, the people who were working on flies in the 70s and 80s got laughed at because they said this has got nothing to do with human biology. Now, and I'm not joking here, in cancer terms, it's got just about everything to do with human biology. So you have to stick to your guns in science and prepare to be laughed at for about um, 20 or 30 years. So this is what's wrong with this fly. Okay, this guy. That's normal. That's the abnormal fly. It's got an abnormality in this um, complex here called polycomb. And the job of polycomb is to coordinate this very fine balance between cell proliferation, so keeping cells in a stem cell state to proliferate to provide enough to grow the various tissues in the embryo, and then cell differentiation, i.e. send this, the cell down a pathway of being a muscle or a neuron or a, a, a photoreceptor cell in the eye. So this balance is key and it's at the core of cancer. And polycomb keeps cells in the cell cycle and effectively inhibits this activity. So that's the balance. That's what's wrong in cancer, in a nutshell. If you look at normal brain development in us, it's complicated, but essentially it starts off with a few cells that need to proliferate and then differentiate. So here you have this balance that's required between proliferation and then differentiation into specialized neurons so you can basically think and do various um, uh, things that you're required to do in life. So you have this tension between proliferation and differentiation and polycomb is absolutely at the core. So this very high-grade, nasty-looking brain tumour here, um, I'll tell you a bit about what, what, this, what this is and why we use this new uh, appellation. When th these, these people looked at a thousand um, diffuse midline gliomas and they found 
in many of them, they had mutations in the histone genes. So the histone genes are the ones around which the DNA strands wrap. And they keep a nice, they, they kind of, you know, in a, partly they keep the DNA safe, you know, because DNA is this long model, mo molecule that tends to unravel and it can wave a bit about and get damaged. But if it's wrapped around a histone protein, it's nicely packed. And moreover, it's not actually doing anything when it's in that form. So it's not transcribing genes, it's not making RNA to make more protein, etc. It's just nicely asleep. That's what histones do. They regulate, they're one of the major regulators of gene expression. So they found in these thousand many histone mutations. And the commonest one was the, this one known as K27 in H3.3. And here's, uh, I guess, a sort of schematic of what I've just said. Stem cells, differentiated cells. Remember I said this is the tension that uh, it underlies cancer. In a differentiated cell, you don't want the cell to be dividing. You want it to be forming the proteins that, say, make it uh, able to, to do contraction if it's going to be a muscle cell, the proteins that allow to transmit at the synapse if it's going to be a nerve cell, etc. So you don't want it proliferating and dividing because that uses up energy and you just won't be able to become specialized. So you have to shut down a lot of the proliferation associated genes. Here they are tightly wrapped around histones. This is the DNA, the black strand, and then um, controlled further by a range of uh, processes including methylation and acetylation by specialized enzymes. So here's polycomb here involved in methylation and um, other genes are, are switched on. So these are tumor suppressor genes that are switched on to stop the proliferative process and vice versa in the stem cell. Uh, here's the H3K27 mutation. When it's mutated, the histone cannot methylate on key sites. And so you get derepression of tumor suppressor genes. So these genes are switched on to suppress proliferation. When you derepress them, they, they switch, they, when you repress them, they switch off and you can get methylation going on. Abnormal situation. They're now known to be different types of tumor with different natural histories. They're basically just about all bad. And so we can now detect some of these mutations by immunohistochemistry, others by sequencing, and um, same in the glioblastomas. Uh, we can detect abnormalities in this uh, protein I IDH1 uh, and concomitant losses of proteins involved in methylation, such as ATRX, which is here, and you can see working with DAX to affect the function of histone 3.3. So, in summary, you have an affectation of methylation in these uh, tumors, which keeps the progenitor cell in a stem cell phase and doesn't allow it to proliferate, hence the proliferation of these very highly malignant tumors. Um, methylation has now been shown to be important in a whole lot of other tumor categories. It's basically reclassified the ependymomas, and so now this is what the limbs needs to look like. It needs to integrate histo, imaging, immunohistochemistry, genetics, metabolomics, uh, and um, also to it now also needs to be able to integrate telepathology at a distance, um, the cross-discipline between radiology and pathology, which really hasn't worked well, let's face it. They sit in separate rooms, often separate buildings. Wouldn't it be nice if they could sit together, they could cut a day or even more off the diagnostic algorithm if they actually spoke to each other in real time. Um, machine learning, which is coming later. I'm just emphasizing this, all this needs to be integrated in the new limbs. And so uh, it'll look like this. All this can be pulled up from your desk, and that's, that's really where Serdan has to head to um, down the line in terms of brain tumors. So this was the past. Happy days, one hour day, one hour working day, etc. cetera. Um, time to ponder manuscripts in Arabic from 1256, for example. You know, we were kind of real connoisseurs of a whole lot of things in those days. And now we can do it all from our computer. And so that means we can work at home. 
or wherever you want in the world. And I put Cape Town here, we could put Sydney, we could put Northern Queensland, or indeed somewhere in rural Northern Ireland, but I hope you get the point. Thank you.